Live in Western Oregon, this is NBC 16 News at 630. President Trump is firing back against critics of his weekend tweets aimed at several minority congresswomen. Thanks for joining us on NBC 16 News at 630. I'm Alexis Thrower. Alan Matthews is on assignment. Jody Reynosa is off. Trump told them to go back to the countries they came from and today expressed no regrets following widespread criticism on Capitol Hill. That's where we find NBC's Susan McGinnis. Four Democratic Congresswomen pushing back against President Trump's remarks many consider racist. This is simply a disruption and a distraction from the callous, chaotic, and corrupt culture of this administration. The United All Front follows down. President Trump delivering a controversial message earlier today. If they don't like it here, they can leave. All they do is complain. So all I'm saying is, if they want to leave, they can leave. The double down follows these tweets, telling four lawmakers to go back to the countries from which they came. He tells us that I should go back to the great borough of the Bronx and make it better. And that's what I'm here to do. Need to Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez one target, along with three other freshman Democrats, all women of color, all U.S. citizens, three born in America. The fourth Minnesota representative, Ilhan Omar, was born in Somalia. He's launching a blatantly racist attack on four duly elected members of the United States of House of Representatives. On Capitol Hill, lawmakers on both sides of the aisle calling the tweets inappropriate. They're race baiting, they're racist, they're meant to divide people. President Trump late today tweeting that the four are endorsing socialism, hate of Israel and the USA, and calling on Democrats to change bad immigration laws. Susan McGinnis, NBC News, Washington. Despite little evidence of White House-backed immigration raids taking place across the country yesterday, the president is still calling the effort a success. And today, the White House announced a new policy which would make it harder for migrants to apply for asylum in the U.S. NBC's Chris Pallone has details. President Trump insists a roundup of undocumented immigrants took place as planned over the weekend. The ICE raids were very successful. People came into our country illegally illegally. Many were felons. Many were convicted of crimes. Uh, many, many were taken out on Sunday. You just didn't know about it. But the president did not provide evidence for his claim, and a senior U.S. official told NBC News only a handful of the 2,000 targeted immigrants had been arrested. It didn't have to start yesterday. The truth is it started a number of days before yesterday, but yesterday was very successful. Earlier, the Trump administration announced new rules targeting people seeking asylum in the U.S. Starting Tuesday, immigrants who pass through Mexico to reach the U.S. must first apply for asylum there. Anyone who doesn't is ineligible for asylum in the United States. And this is something America has been very generous about in the in the past, and yet it's being fraudulently abused right now, and it's part of what's causing the crisis at the border. There's no indication Mexico has agreed to the new policy, and critics are already taking aim. When it comes to immigration and asylum laws, this administration is creating more chaos, more havoc into a already overburdened system. The American Civil Liberties Union says it will sue to block the policy from being implemented. Chris Pallone, NBC News. The new rule follows a Trump policy change from earlier this year, which forces some asylum seekers at the southern border to stay in Mexico to wait for their cases to be heard instead of waiting inside the U.S. And locally, the Eugene Police Department says crime in migrant and minority communities is severely underreported. The chief of police hopes the growing concerns over immigration policies don't worsen the situation. Chief Skinner wants to reiterate local police are restricted by Oregon law from giving information to or working with ICE. We want people to feel like they can come to us for help, not because they're going to be uh, criticized or marginalized for their status. And so that's, that's an important piece of what community policing is in the 21st century, is trying to create an atmosphere where all victims feel safe to be able to report crime. Visit our website at NBC16.com to hear from a local immigration lawyer on the growing concerns surrounding immigration policies.
Billionaire Jeffrey Epstein will remain behind bars as a federal judge decides whether or not to grant bail on charges he sexually abused underage girls. The accused sexual predator is fighting to be released from jail while he awaits trial. Epstein's lawyers want him released on house arrest, but federal prosecutors say he's a flight risk and danger to the community. Epstein was arrested last week and pleaded not guilty to charges of sex trafficking crimes with minors. Federal agents seized evidence from his homes in New York and Florida where the alleged abuse occurred. The judge in the case said he'll announce his decision on bail Thursday. On to our first look at weather. NBC 16's Travis Knutson, excuse me, Travis Knutson, yes, joins us now. Few extra clouds across western Oregon today, and as a result, temperatures not quite as warm as we saw over the weekend. We still made it to 78 degrees in Eugene, 75 in Corvallis, nice and comfortable on the coast. North Bend Coos Bay area, 72 degrees in Roseburg in the 80s today. Satellite and radar loop for the last couple of hours. There's been the occasional little sprinkle out there, but all around pretty dry today, and that's how much of the next day or two will pan out. But temperatures tonight will cool down to the mid to upper 50s for many locations. Highs for our Tuesday, upper 70s, low 80s once again, but clouds remain common and there is the opportunity for a couple rain showers coming up in our forecast. I'll tell you exactly when our best chance to see some rain will be. That's minutes away. A follow up to a story we brought you last week. Police say a Greek man is being questioned in the killing of an American scientist on the island of Crete. Authorities said the 27 year old man was detained today in connection with the death of 59 year old Suzanne Eaton. Police said they interviewed 10 people over the weekend as part of the investigation. Eaton, a California native working in Germany, was attending a conference on Crete when she went missing on July 2nd. Her body was found a week ago inside an abandoned World War II bunker. Authorities in Greece said the molecular biologist had been suffocated. A coroner said her death resulted from a criminal act, but did not provide more details of the autopsy. A funeral home owner in Crete said Eaton's body will be sent to Germany tomorrow. Former boxing world champion Pernell Sweet P. Whitaker has died after being struck by a car in Virginia. Whitaker was hit and killed while crossing a street in Virginia Beach yesterday night. The 55 year old was pronounced dead at the scene. A police investigation into Whitaker's death is ongoing. However, according to police, it does not occur appear that drugs or alcohol or excessive speed played a part in the accident. Whitaker, who was the undisputed lightweight world champion, won titles in four different different weight classes in the 1980s and 1990s. He won an Olympic gold medal in 1984 in Los Angeles, and he was named Boxer of the Year by Ring Magazine in 1989. Whitaker finished his Hall of Fame career with a 44-1 and record and was inducted into the International Boxing Hall of Fame in 2006. We see these situations uh, where people are not supposed to be on the highway. We do what we can to close off access to the highway. Some people ignore all the efforts we make to keep them away from there. And we often sometimes see tragedy on the roads. A crash this morning along I-205 in Clackamas County killed a pedestrian. ODOT says that crash reflects a growing problem. The person was hit and killed on the northbound side of the freeway. The victim's body ended up in the freeway's left lane and in the emergency lane along the center median. ODOT says there's a growing problem of people walking along or even trying to walk across freeways and highways across the state. Portland police say a suspicious item found at a city hall at City Hall this morning did not contain any explosives. Security found the item that prompted a three hour long evacuation. The Metropolitan Explosives Disposal Unit used a remote controlled robot to examine the item. Police won't say exactly what was in it, but they said it was harmless. Investigators are not sure whether it will be investigated as a crime, but it comes at a time when City Hall has received an increase in threatening messages and letters. The people who open our mail here, the people who read emails, the people who answer the phones, they're just ordinary folks trying to get through their day and do a good job. And when you add on top of that the potential threat to their public safety, you can understand why that would be disconcerting to people. This comes only weeks after City Hall was evacuated because of a bomb threat. Police are still investigating that incident. Mayor Wheeler says he's hesitant to increase security at City Hall and likely won't make a decision until after he reviews incident reports. 
Coming up next on NBC 16 at 6.30, we spotlight education as preschoolers learn how to safely navigate the community with the Safety Town program. And at the college level, OSU has some remarkable research to help better understand causes of a birth defect that affects the skull. News at 6:30. Today, some of the city's smallest citizens learned how to safely navigate the community thanks to the Eugene Police Department. Pre-kindergartners students gathered together at Prairie Mountain School for Safety Town. And this is our 15th year of Safety Town. They're going into kindergarten next year, and we really, really enjoy getting a chance to engage with them before they go into school. We talk about bicycle safety and pedestrian safety and poison and things like that, water safety, fire safety, and give them their first touch into kind of traffic safety and how to be safe out in our community. Have the uh, other group of kids in little pedal cars uh, on the town driving around and having them stopping at stop signs and waiting for pedestrians and we think that if we can raise this generation of youngsters that are safety conscious then we uh, we're, we're headed in the right direction and that's how we drive crime down as we start at this age so we want these uh, important lessons and messages to stick with them the street crime unit is taking people off the, the bad guys off the street they're they're improving eugene does safety town coincide with that and springboard off of that sure it does i mean it, you know it's never too learned to understand the principles of safety and how to make safe decisions and so that starts with our with our kids and it starts in our homes and in our families talking about those tough decisions teaching them how to watch just because you think the car is stopping for you that you want to make sure that it's come to a complete stop that it's safe these little guys and gals they can start helping us create a more livable Eugene too and so we're in this together and so just at different stages I've got a 12 and 10 year old at home that are in this community going to school in this community I'm not just a police chief I'm a dad and so I want to make sure that I take care of this community through those eyes. Safety Town Camp lasts two weeks, and it's not just the little ones who have all the fun. Local teens are volunteering to help out counselors as well. Meanwhile, kids on the South Coast also are learning all about safety at the Coos Bay Boys and Girls Club. First up, they're practicing stop, drop, and roll with the fire department. The idea is to introduce them to the safety professionals in the area and to give them an idea on the lessons that they'll start learning in schools. Miss Coos County helped lead the group. She says these are skills for a safer, healthy life. Knowing traffic rules, knowing what the importance of a fireman and a police officer is in your community and knowing that you can give back to your community by being a safe, respectful and responsible individual. The program is full this summer, but registration opens back up, back up next year. Researchers at OSU have made a huge discovery. They now understand the causes of a serious birth defect that affects the skull. Roughly 58,000 children will be born with craniosynostosis, a brain disorder that stunts early development. A mutation causes the skull to create bone where there shouldn't be, putting pressure on the brain that needs room to grow. Medical problems include impaired vision, mental function, as well as an abnormal shaped head. It's rare in biology where we can say this caused that. Normally we sound like, well, it's an association, right? But in this case, we have the ability to say this mutation the patient had caused the disease because we proved it. Visit our website at NBC16.com for the full report where LEAD explains the next step in pinpointing a treatment for those in need. Turning to weather now, NBC 16's Travis Knutson is standing by for a look at what's coming up in your full forecast. Hey, Travis. Quite a few clouds across western Oregon today, as seen in our time lapse. The low clouds didn't quite clear out entirely for the afternoon hours, but we do have more clouds and maybe even some rain showers in the forecast. I'll tell you when next. That is a thing of beauty. Knutson. 
bit of an overcast Monday across western Oregon, and that doesn't change a whole lot as we move through the work week. In fact, the next couple of days you could say will be somewhat gray and temperatures are high temperatures below average, not by a significant amount, but a couple degrees below average for the middle of July, and maybe a little bit of rain is on the way as we get into our Thursday, particularly Thursday morning. It's not the highest chance we've seen, but it's the best chance in the last week or so for any rain around the region. Satellite and radar loop for much of the afternoon has had a few little rain showers showing up across parts of the Willamette Valley, decently dry for Douglas and Coos County. And for the most part, this evening will miss out on any rain showers. If you do see a sprinkle or two, you're one of the lucky few who have those raindrops falling from the sky. Most of Western Oregon remains dry. However, there is that opportunity come Thursday for some rain locally, and it's all because of this storm system here up in the Gulf of Alaska. It's still getting its act together. It's not too organized at this point in time, but as we move forward, it'll start to form into a bit more of a well-structured storm system, sliding its way down the coast of British Columbia, and it's this cold front, the line of rain riding along the cold front that should arrive uh, Wednesday night into Thursday morning. There's a little bit of a 12 hour variation on when exactly the showers arrive, but at this point, Thursday morning looks to be when this cold front will move its way through the Pacific Northwest. Riding along with it is the opportunity for some rain, so we could wake up Thursday to a few rain showers around the region. Nothing significant, but maybe a little bit of rain on the way as we get into later on this week. But in the short term, the clouds are here to stay, and there is enough moisture in the atmosphere to present the opportunity for a couple raindrops out there, but they won't be too terribly common. Here's six o'clock in the morning for our Tuesday, where everybody's waking up to some gray conditions. Higher elevations, the Cascades, the coastal mountain range could see a couple of raindrops, but as far as the coast is concerned or the inland valleys, probably not seeing any localized rainfall as we head through Tuesday or Wednesday. There's the opportunity for it, but it's not too common. Again, here at three o'clock in the afternoon, there's a couple little green blips here on our more forecast model. The opportunity for a few sprinkles, but very hit or miss. Most of us stay very dry throughout our Tuesday. Same to be said for Wednesday. In fact, here's Wednesday morning at 7 a.m. Waking up gray, a couple little raindrops here and there around the region, but overwhelmingly we're pretty dry. As we head into our Wednesday afternoon, seeing more clouds from the northwest start to move on in, and that is where our rain opportunity, particularly Thursday morning, comes from comes from the northwest. Now, as far as temperatures go tomorrow, it'll be about where we were at this afternoon, mid to upper 70s, which is below average by a couple degrees degrees for this time of year. As we head into the week, we'll stay in that upper 70 degree range, hitting 80 by Friday, but even the weekend will remain a little below average. Maybe next week we'll see some mid 80s for the area on the coast, upper 60s, low 70s expected for our Tuesday. Clouds will be very common around the region. Some sun breaks are possible, but there won't be very many. Rain chances on Thursday, about a 40% chance in the morning hours. Across Douglas County, low 80s on the way, a few spots not even making it to 80 degrees. Remote Myrtle Creek Glide, for example, seeing a high of 79 and the seven day forecast here for Roseburg a bit farther to the south. Rain chance is a little bit smaller on Thursday, but Thursday morning we could see a few raindrops around the region. By the time we hit the weekend, sunshine and mid 80s return to Douglas County. Thank you so much, Travis. And Central Oregon would be the center of the state's emergency response in the worst case scenario if the big one ever hits Oregon. The Bend area is listed as a backup emergency coordination center in the state's revised Cascadia playbook. It's a 100 page outline of actions that would be taken in the first hours and days after the disaster. The Redmond Regional Airport would play a key role in those emergency plans. Scientists are predicting a possible 9.0 scale earthquake and some subsequent tsunami that could strike along a 700 mile subduction zone. As of right now, we have been identified as a, a critical um, incident support um, base, um, one of the few in Oregon. Uh, resources, people, supplies, equipment will be flown or trucked into uh, Central Oregon, uh, most likely here at the Redmond Airport. Emergency managers say these plans are moving forward because Central Oregon and points east are expected to escape with light to moderate damage from a catastrophic quake. Other sites to set up state emergency operations are also being discussed. Coming up next on NBC 16 at 630, the Roseburg skate team is looking to prove themselves at the national championships and one skater is looking to prove nothing can hold her back. Prevagen is the number one farm. 16 News at 630. The Roseburg skate team is gearing up for nationals this week, where four of their athletes qualify to compete. And by making it to that big stage, one of those skaters is also proving nothing will hold her back. NBC 16's Maria Santora reports. 
When it comes to the Roseburg skate team, they're rolling with passionate athletes. What I absolutely love about skating is I get to work with my team. My favorite part about the whole thing is when our coach plays music and we get to line up and do whatever we want to it. And that passion has no limits. I think when I first showed up, they were shocked, like, who is this woman? And if she falls, she's going to break a hip. At the age of 60, Tamla LaHaye decided it was time to break out her skates again. After a 47-year break, I took it up again about a year and a half ago. But rolling back onto the rink after all that time came with its challenges. Had to relearn everything everything that includes changes in equipment first off my skates were they belong in a museum now and recovery time when I fell as a child it was no big deal when I fall now it's a big deal to help bring her up to speed Tamla turns to her tinier teammates for some tips I watch some of the younger girls and it's completely different from how I was taught to do it I'm thinking hmm I need to try it that way. Despite a few bumps and bruises, when she does perfect a new skill. Huge accomplishment. I thought I was just the bee's knees. And her teammates think so too. She was really, really encouraging. We usually spend a lot of time together when I'm getting ready. She came to me and said, but you did great. She usually helps me with dance and figures. So Tamil is not only welcomed by her younger pals, she also qualified for nationals in her first competition, proving age. It's just a number. It's a big number, but it's just a number. And if you have the drive, you just go for it. Reporting in Roseburg, Maria Santora. She has the best personality ever. And the National Roller Skating Championships start July 17th in Spokane, Washington. And coming up next on NBC 16 at 630, if you're a history buff, we got some interesting news to unravel about one of the pyramids in Egypt. Everyone that comes to Natural Dentures has a different story. Ancient 4,600 year old pyramid to Taurus. The so-called Bent Pyramid is about 25 miles south of Cairo and has been closed since 1965 for repairs. Archaeologists even found hidden tombs and some mummies and masks during nearby excavations that started last year. And thank you so much for watching and we will see you at 11. Previously on The Big Bang Theory. I'm going to the Arctic.